introducing myself. Is that better? Um, all right. Welcome, welcome, everybody to bird watching for beginners, kiddos, whoever is joining us this evening. It's brought to you by the Nevada Department of Wildlife. And it's hosted tonight by Parker Flickinger of the Lahontan Audubon Society. And it's moderated by myself. My name is Dawn Anderson and I'm the Hunter Education and Archery Education Coordinator with the Nevada Department of Wildlife. And we have Scout Kirby helping along as well. Scout, you wanna, do you wanna talk about yourself for a second? Yeah, um, I worked for the Nevada Department of Wildlife for two years as an AmeriCorps wildlife educator. Um, at this point, I don't work with them anymore, but I am a volunteer. So that's why I'm here today to help out. Excited to be here. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad you're here. So welcome everybody. And then we'll let Parker here in a minute introduce himself because he's the highlight of the night. So thank you for joining the Nevada Department of Wildlife for a conservation education program. This is a family-friendly program and it's rated PG. Profanity or inappropriate behaviors will not be tolerated in the chat or Q&A. And all questions in the chat and Q&A should be on topic. Failing to follow these guidelines will result in possibly being muted from the chat or Q&A or possibly being removed from the live stream. So just a loose agenda for you. Welcome. Introductions. Scout and I did ours and we're going to hand the floor over to Parker here in just a minute and he'll give you, he'll give you all his background information and then some. So we're looking at bird watching for beginners and we're looking at about 30 to 45 minutes in time. Please place all of your questions in the Q&A box. And then following this webinar, you will receive a link to a survey. We, I, strongly encourage you to fill them out. Give us your feedback and let us know what you'd like to see more of, even possibly throw out some topics that you'd like to see. We openly welcome them. So with that being said, I am going to hand over the floor to Parker. And Parker, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Don. Welcome everyone. My name is Parker Flickinger and I am the Community Engagement and Marketing Coordinator for Lahontan Audubon Society. Um, uh, Don, could you uh, let me screen share? Ah, good, it's off, thank you. So I will get started on my webinar now, which is all about beginning backyard bird watching, uh, which uh, is something uh, very special about our state of Nevada is how there are so many birds everywhere and they are so easy to find. Uh, you can practically find them in your own backyard or park. All right, as I said, my name is Parker Flickinger. Uh, I am an employee at Lahontan Audubon Society, and I also uh, work, uh, on, I'm uh, an employee through the AmeriCorps program uh, as well. Uh, an Amer I am an AmeriCorps VISTA. So the first things, let's get off. What is bird watching? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, Many people have many ideas about that. Uh, maybe you think about, say, uh, these people who are on the Christmas bird count in uh, 2015. Well, basically, uh, you're all right. All your answers are right. Bird watching is just the activity, the process of going out uh, to your own backyard, to your local park, and appreciating the birds in any way you see fit. You can use your eyes and you can use your ears or any of your senses to find birds. So, and anyone can do it. Anybody, regardless of their income, regardless of their origin, uh, anybody can do it. Uh, you don't need to buy expensive binoculars or take uh, expensive vacations to the wilderness to go bird watching. Although that can definitely help. Uh, you probably have seen this goofy comedy movie, The Big Year. Uh, it's all about uh, competitive bird watching and it starred Owen Wilson, Steve Martin, and Jack Black. It's exaggerated, but still fun and a nice uh, intro to bird watching. So I'll kick this off by talking about uh, your local parks. All of the birds uh, that I'm listing in this webinar have been seen uh, 
And uh, all of them actually have been seen by myself uh, or my colleagues in your local parks in Reno or uh, Sparks. I wanted to also uh, introduce this program, Birding by Bus. It's a recent program we just debuted on our website. And what it is, is it's uh, a map of all of our favorite parks to bird watch in the greater Reno Sparks metro area. And all of these parks are within walking distance of a bus stop. So if you go on to our website, nevadaaudubon.org forward slash bus, it will take you to the Birding by Bus website, which uh, has that interactive map all about the birds and the parks and which bus routes uh, will take you to the park. So this was a collaboration between our La Haunt and Audubon and the Regional Transportation Commission of Washoe County. I highly recommend checking it out if you're interested in going birding uh, in our community. So uh, let me get off started with a disclaimer about bird watching. Bird watching is different from doing other uh, recreation in the park. Uh, the key difference is that uh, quietness is appreciated by all. By being quiet and uh, while you're bird watching, it enables your hearing and your senses to be more active and focused. And it also uh, avoids scaring the birds away so that everybody can get a chance to watch birds. Um, the other thing, of course, as you probably uh, expected, uh, while you are bird watching, please, please do not litter. I have worked in parks and when you litter, some poor worker has to pick them up uh, for you. Don't litter. So, and the other question is, uh, can you still watch bird watch during the pandemic? Yes, you can definitely bird watch during the pandemic. The social distancing rules uh, are still apply, but in some ways it's a great uh, time to, uh, if you've been cooped up in your house, bird watching can offer you, give you the escape that you really need. So I still recommend bird watching. We actually even have our field trips going on uh, now as well. So now I'll get started by talking about parts of a bird. And knowing the parts of a bird are important because the parts of a bird can uh, reveal your name, uh, the, na the bird's name. So say there's birds like the yellow rumped warbler or the white crowned sparrow. You can probably guess that the uh, white crowned sparrow has a white head. The part of it right here has a white head and the yellow rump warbler, this part of it uh, is yellow, it's rump. It also, uh, knowing the parts of the bird uh, is important for uh, when you're bird watching to help you identify it. Uh, oftentimes people will say when they see a, a bird uh, out in the park, uh, what that bird with the red breast uh, and you'll know that's what they're talking about. This is the bird's breast and uh, if you ask that question someone might answer that bird with the red breast is the American robin. More about robins later. So now people talk about birds. They either talk about birds as being migratory birds or resident birds. Migratory birds are birds that are passing through an area um, and they usually uh, pass through the area with the changing seasons. Uh, this famous example I've got is the Canada geese. Uh, they are migrants. Uh, they migrate uh, from, they start off in the summers in Canada and then they migrate down through the states here in Nevada and uh, down to Central America where they spend the winters. And then uh, when the winters are over, they migrate back through the states up to Canada where they forage on the lush uh, berries in the wilderness. So that's why uh, during the fall and spring, you will often see geese migrating through in a V flock. The opposite of migratory birds are birds uh, that are resident in our area. Um, this example I have here is the California quail. California quail are resident, so uh, just like you and your residents, uh, they are here in uh, northern Nevada year round. You'll find them in summer, spring, winter, or fall. They live here, they raise their chicks here, they are resident. 
Another thing to think about with birds is sexual dimorphism. Di means to, morphism means appearance. And what sexual dimorphism refers to is when two birds of di uh, different genders but the same species look extremely different from each other. The example I have here is a common bird known as the Brewer's Blackbird. You often see Brewer's Blackbirds in parks, golf courses, or even the parking lot of Walmart and McDonald's. They're common there. The male Brewer's Blackbird is jet black and it's got this yellow glassy eye. That's the male, whereas the female is this dusty brown color. They're the same species, but they look different depending on their gender. That's sexual dimorphism. The opposite of sexual dimorphism is sexual monomorphism. Mono means one and morphism means appearance. So you probably, you're probably guessing that uh, what that means, but uh, the answer is simple. Uh, birds that are sexually monomorphic are where the male and the female of the bird species look the same. This example we have here is the Stellar's Jay, which is often seen if you're traveling up to the Sierras, going to Tahoe or going skiing. This is a male on the left side, a male Stellar's Jay. This is a female Stellar's Jay on the right side. They're different genders. They look the same. They're the same species. That is sexual monomorphism. So I would like to say uh, if you are interested in seriously pursuing bird watching or learning about all the different species of birds we have here in northern Nevada, I highly recommend picking up a bird book. These bird books are called field guides and they have lists of all the bird species. They have maps on where the birds are and what the birds look like. This boy is on the uh, Christmas bird count and he's identifying woodpeckers with his bird book. There are many different types of bird guides available, uh, but really I found from using them, there is no wrong answer with a bird guide. They're all great. Uh, the National uh, Geographic guide is wonderful. The uh, Kaufman guides are wonderful or uh, the Peterson guides. Any guide really is great to use. There's plenty of other options. You can learn more about birds uh, by yourself as well. Uh, a great website to check out is the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They have, uh, if you go online with your parents, you can uh, Google the Cornell Lab of Ornithology where they have plenty of articles all about the birds uh, and where they can be found as well. Of course, for local birds, uh, we have our website, nevadaaudubon.org. We frequently post on our websites and social media pages about places to go bird watching or about interesting birds that have been sighted in our parks. Definitely check us out uh, for local examples. And finally, of course, there is the Washoe County Library System. There are plenty of libraries around in our community. And generally, any library has a, a bird field guide uh, available for, to borrow from it. So if you want to borrow a bird field guide, check out your library. They will most likely be there for you to use. I would also recommend if you're interested in going uh, seriously going on bird walks to pick up a pair of binoculars. Uh, binoculars aren't necessary, but they make it a lot easier to see birds up close and identify what species they are. I highly recommend uh, when if you and your parents decide to purchase a pair of binoculars, I recommend uh, purchasing a larger pair of binoculars as opposed to the tiny pocket ones. Uh, this pair I have here is an example and you can see uh, for size reference, I put a dollar next to it. Uh, it's about like 10 inches uh, long uh, and uh, 10 inches wide a square. The larger is the better, it uh, lets it uh, more light in and it is easier to adjust the focus. So now after all the background, 
let's get into some of the bird types you will probably see or maybe already have seen in our local parks. Our first group is the passerine birds. Uh, this group of birds are also known as the perching birds as they are commonly associated with perching on tree limbs or telephone wires. This example here is the small bird, the lesser goldfinch, which you'll often see at your bird feeders. Here is uh, the example of some of our passerine birds and uh, I will play you their bird calls so you can uh, hear them. Uh, a lot of times you might not see birds while you're in a park, but you can definitely hear them. Our first bird is the American robin. You commonly see American robins in fields because they love to pick worms out of the dirt and eat worms like this bird in this photo is doing. Here's their call. The American robin, one of uh, the most widespread birds in the US actually. Shifting gears now, I want to talk about the western meadowlark. Uh, this, the western meadowlark, uh, you commonly see that if you're driving south, say, uh, towards Carson City, especially on rural roads. They often perch on, say, barbed wire fences, looking for uh, food, for insects they can eat. They also have a distinct call, which is often used in movie sound effects. Here it is. That is the Western Meadowlark. Here are some more passerine birds. Uh, this next one is the California scrub jay. Uh, they often forage on insects and berries and nuts. Uh, you'll see them in the parks and this is their call. The California scrub jay. Uh, over here is the red-winged blackbird. Red-winged blackbirds uh, often are seen now this time of year in the cattails. They love to build their nests in the cattails. Uh, so you'll commonly see them in parks like uh, um, Sparks Marina or uh, um, uh, Paradise Park or Oxbow Nature Center. Basically, anywhere around where there's a river and there are cattails, you'll find red-winged blackbirds. Here is the call of the male red-winged blackbird. Yep, that's the red-winged blackbird. And finally, this is the house sparrow, another common bird. Uh, you commonly see this in parking lots like the Brewer's Blackbird. Uh, they were brought over from Europe, so they love to forage on things we leave behind like uh, forage and trash cans. Our next group is the waterfowl, which I imagine some of you hunters are familiar with. Uh, the waterfowl are birds that are adapted to live in or near the water. I've got the most famous example, the mallard duck, uh, which you often see mallard ducks in a uh, the wetlands and lakes here in northern Nevada, like uh, Sparks Marina again, Paradise Park, uh, or uh, all along the Truckee River, they're commonly seen paddling up and down the river. For other two examples I have that are common waterfowl, uh, we have the Canada Goose, which I talked about earlier. Uh, they migrate through, but some Canada geese actually have uh, decided to become residents here in Nevada. So if you go out to parks around this time of year, it's common to see uh, a group of about a dozen goslings following two, their two geese parents. So uh, the other one here is the common merganser. This is a type of duck uh, that is adapted to dive underwater and eat fish. Uh, you can see this is a female with her chicks and she's got this long pointed beak which she uses to snag the fish. So I've got uh, this uh, which is talking about waterfowl behavior. Uh, 
what you see when you're in a park. And if you ran into some waterfowl in the lake, uh, you might see them doing these actions. Uh, um, mallards do what is called dabbling. Uh, this is where they stick their heads under the water to look for food uh, and uh, um, especially pond weeds, which they love to eat. Uh, that's dabbling. Whereas the opposite of that is diving. This is what uh, the mergansers do. Uh, they dive underwater where they chase fish and snag them with their long beaks. These are some uh, uh, male and female mergansers diving down to chase fish. Uh, the females are the gray uh, ducks uh, and the males are the white and black ducks. Uh, so uh, now you know that males and female mergansers look different do you know what that is? Yep, that is sexual dimorphism. Common mergansers have sexual dimorphism. Our next group is the birds of prey, uh, also known as the raptors. These are birds which are adapted to be predators. They feed on um, other animals, uh, such as mammals, uh, rodents, reptiles, or even other birds. Um, this uh, common widespread example is the red tail hawk. You often see these when you're walking around. If you look up in the sky, uh, they'll be soaring in the sky like in this picture. Uh, here is the red tailed hawk called. Yep, that's the red tail hawk, which uh, is another common sound effect bird. They often use the red tail hawk call to uh, play for sound effects for our next bird, which is the bald eagle, our national bird. Bald eagles are commonly seen around ranches, uh, specifically ranches, say, uh, near Carson City or near Fernley, those areas. Bald eagles, they love to hang around here, uh, um, especially during the uh, winter uh, and early spring when it's calving season. They uh, eat the cattle after birth. So if you'd be driving around near a cattle ranch, you might see about uh, half a dozen bald eagles soaring in the sky or sitting on the telephone wire. Uh, if you see them, you'll know they've just been eating the afterbirth. That's what they're doing. Our, my final example is the Cooper's hawk. This is another hawk uh, that lives in northern Nevada. You commonly see it perching, uh, especially around fields where it uses its bright eyes and is looking for uh, small rodents that are uh, on the ground like rabbits and rats, which it can fly down, catch, uh, and catch for food. Uh, the way to tell Cooper's hawks uh, um, uh, different from red-tailed hawks is one, they're smaller than red-tailed hawks, but two, uh, Cooper's hawks have this rectangular tail you see right here, whereas red tails, their tail fans out like this. So that's another uh, identification tip as well. So our next group is the woodpeckers. Woodpeckers are birds which are adapted. Uh, they have long beaks, so they are adapted to peck holes in the trees. They peck holes in the trees because they like to, uh, they're uh, searching for food and they like to eat, say, insects that live in the tree bar, or some of them like to eat tree sap. They also peck holes in the trees uh, so they can uh, um, create a tree ho hole hollow called a cavity and then they build their nests inside the tree cavity. This example is the white-headed woodpecker, which is again commonly seen up in the Sierras around Tahoe. Um, for a more common woodpecker, we have the northern flicker, which again is commonly seen in parks. Here is the northern flicker's call. northern flicker. You commonly see them in parks like uh, the Oxbow Nature Study Area and sometimes Rancho San Rafael Park. This next group is ground birds. Ground birds are adapted to live on the ground. Uh, they can fly, 
but they can only really fly in short bursts and uh, they only really fly to get away from predators. The most famous ground bird is, of course, the wild turkey. Uh, they're pretty rare here in northern Nevada, but they are present. However, the more common ground bird is the California quail. You can see these all over at different parks uh, in Reno. Here's the California quail call. Yes, uh, a lot of people think that the California quail call, it sort of sounds like they're saying, Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. So if you hear that in a park, uh, you'll know that's a California quail. This next group is shorebirds. Uh, shorebirds are birds that are uh, commonly seen uh, on uh, the shores of lakes, rivers, and streams. They hang out there uh, where they forage for food. Uh, they also uh, are known for having long stilt-like legs and long bills. Uh, their long legs enable them to walk in the water and their long bills enable them to pick food out of the water. This example I have here is the American avocet. Uh, the American avocet is commonly uh, seen uh, this time of year in Reno and Sparks uh, because uh, they breed down here and spend the summers. Uh, you can commonly see them say at lakes like uh, Sparks Marina and uh, Paradise Park in Sparks. Uh, another shorebird that is resident year round is the keel deer. This shorebird is uh, seen uh, at uh, uh, by shores, but also on flat areas and uh, they have a shrill call. I'll play it for you. That's the killdeer call. And what's special about the killdeer is sometimes, uh, especially now in spring, killdeer are building their nests and they build their nests just on the dusty ground. However, if you go near a killdeer nest, uh, the killdeer will start making its shrill calls, and then it'll do what's in the picture on the right here. Uh, it'll start running around, and it'll do a broken wing act, where it will pretend that its wings are broken. And what it's trying to do with its broken wing act is to distract you, and it will lead you away from its nest. Uh, and it'll be running, parading all in front of you. Uh, they want, it wants you to chase them, uh, which I encourage you to chase them, but good luck catching them. They almost always fly away at the last minute. There are plenty of other uh, bird groups uh, besides the ones I've listed, such as raptors and ground birds. Uh, you probably can think of a few birds uh, and name a few that I have not listed because I, I don't really have the time to list them all. But uh, these other birds I have here are, again, birds that are commonly seen in northern Nevada, and you have probably maybe already heard their calls. This first one is the Anna's hummingbird. Hummingbirds are small and adapted to live on the nectar of flowers. Yes, Anna's hummingbirds like to spend the winters here in northern Nevada, and they are also very common in the springtime when all our flowers are blooming. This next one is another common bird, uh, and uh, it's another sound effect bird, the morning dove. Have a listen. Morning doves really are a dime a dozen. You can see them on the ground. You can see them perched in trees or telephone wires or even flying in the sky. Finally, we have the kingfishers. Uh, this bird we have here is the belted kingfisher, which uh, um, 
what kingfishers do is they fly around and dive underwater uh, so they can catch fish. Uh, as you probably guess, uh, they are present in areas where fish are common, such as uh, in walks along the Truckee River. Here is the kingfisher call. Yep, that's the kingfisher. So now for, for a wrap up, I'd like to say, uh, I'd like to share this quote by, quote by birder Chris Cooper. Birds belong to everybody. Nobody owns the birds. They're for all of us to enjoy, all of us to get out there and appreciate. I couldn't agree more about this quote. Birds really are everywhere. They are in the parks around us. They can be seen in your backyard. They can even be seen uh, from your window or when you're just walking around the street. And the bird, bird watching is something that anyone and everyone can do. Everyone can feel welcome. So I highly encourage, if you have a chance, do definitely get involved. It's easy. There's so many resources out there. I can't uh, promote it enough. Finally, I will say happy birding, and I wish you the best on your adventures, especially now that I've seen, given you the knowledge, it's your chance to get out there, go bird watching, and enjoy yourselves. Thank you very much. Parker, that was wonderful. I love all of the sounds and everything that you included in there. I am super impressed. You're very welcome, Dawn. Thank you for your praise. There is, um, there was a, a request for maybe next time you could add the cherry up cheerio for one of the robins. Oh, yes. <laughs> that that, was, uh, yeah, I hadn't that's heard one of her favorite. Uh, thinking of that as the cherry up cheerio, but that's a, a good example, yes. Can I share just really quick, this was, this is something I wasn't looking at doing, but can I share real quick? Let me see if I can, hold on, let me get it on here. Um, give me a second. Um, can you see the Lahatan page? Can you yes. see? Okay. I want to share your page real quick. So it's um, nevadaaudubon.org. And okay. if, if you don't mind, could there's you have birds of the month, you have your social media plugs on there, um, frequently asked questions, but you guys do field trips and stuff. Do you, or do you know anything about that? Could you talk on behalf of it? Yes, I could definitely talk on behalf of it. Uh, field trips are back. Uh, we've restarted our public birding field trips. Uh, they are by registration only. Uh, so uh, yeah, so what you can do is if you scroll down, there should be a calendar. Uh, yeah, down there, there's a calendar. And uh, if you look on our calendar, uh, it has events like webinars, but there are also field trips like uh, on the 21st, that's a field trip. If you click on that uh, um, on our calendar, it'll give you a, it'll pop up a window and then there'll be a link uh, when it opens for registering and once you register, we share with you uh, the meeting time, the location, uh, if you need to bring uh, what uh, outdoor gear is recommended. Yes. So, so uh, I would highly encourage anybody who is interested, definitely uh, please register for our field trips. We welcome everyone. Are they beginner based or they're, are they for people that have a little bit more knowledge than just basic information or just starting out? Um, generally, they, they are for everyone. Uh, if you click on it, it'll give you a blurb about it. But uh, if they are for more uh, advanced bird watchers, uh, it will say uh, for advanced bird watchers. Yes, or it'll encourage you. Uh, it will encourage the more advanced bird watchers to register. Yes. Perfect. That is what I am looking for. I just wanted to plug your page out there. Um, 
if anybody has any questions, um, go ahead and drop them in the Q&A and we will direct them towards Parker. If you have any questions that he can answer about birding, something maybe that you would like to see in the future or maybe a more in-depth one. If you'd like us to bring Parker back, cause I would like to, <laughs> um, go ahead and drop it in the Q&A and we'll give you just a few minutes here to do that. Um, again, there's contacts there. If you want to get a hold of me for whatever reason, my contact information is there. Parker's information is there as well, his email. So at this point, I recommend everybody, because everybody has a phone nowadays, go ahead and take out your phone and take a screenshot of it or write down that phone number. And if you have any questions for Parker, go ahead and send him an email. Otherwise, I am not seeing any questions. Thank you, Ariana and Laura. And Laura says, thank you for sharing. I learned something new, which is my daily goal. <laughs> You're very welcome, Laura. That's an awesome daily goal, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. Something we should always be shooting for. Yes, lifelong learners is what I like to refer to it as. So I'm not seeing anything else. Parker, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here. I know we had to reschedule a couple times, but thank you for being flexible with us and um, finally making this happen. Scout, thank you for being here and moderating with me. I love that I have two phenomenal bird people here on this webinar with me. It has been a pleasure to be with both of you guys the last, what, 45 minutes to an hour. So on that note, if I'm not seeing any more questions, I think we will wrap it up for the night. Thank you. Thank you for letting me uh, come in and give my presentation, John. Yeah, thanks for letting me join. And also it was lovely meeting